The earliest written record of a kite tells the story of a Chinese general in 206 BC who flew a kite over a wicked emperor's palace. He marked the line to measure the distance, then reeled it in. His small army then dug a tunnel into the palace courtyard, launching a surprise attack that conquered the emperor. Today's two-line kite, as the name implies, has two lines to pilot it. It can fly nearly 40 meters high. This kite is made mainly of a lightweight nylon fabric that is waterproof and fade resistant. It's less than a millimeter thick, so it's reinforced with nylon mesh to reduce ripping. The kite's other components include nylon and elastic cords and straps, fittings made of leather, rubber, aluminum and plastic, and carbon rods. The kite maker starts with a pattern made out of pressed wood. She marks out a piece of fabric and, with a few bricks to hold the fabric in place, cuts it diagonally. In sewing terms, that's called cutting on the bias. This will stretch the fabric and help it fly. Next, she cuts more pieces of fabric, this time in a different color. This kite has eight fabric parts that fit together like a puzzle to create a two and a half meter wingspan. The kite's left and right sides are mirror images, so there are only four different shapes to cut. They range in length from 25 centimeters to 1.2 meters. From start to finish, it takes one worker about two hours to make this model called the Dragonfly. First, the kite maker sews the longest part, called the belly, to the other parts. She double stitches with heavy-duty nylon thread to help the kite withstand winds of up to 35 kilometers an hour. She makes tiny incisions along the belly's curved edge so she can fold it and sew in what's called tension line. Tension line is a type of nylon cord she'll sew into all the seams of the kite's lower sections. It'll give the kite some structure and help keep it rigid while airborne. The kite maker secures each line with a knot, which can later be loosened or tightened to adjust the kite's overall tension. The kite maker uses straps made of very durable yet flexible plastic to line the middle and the edges of the wings. The straps strengthen the kite, enabling it to survive crashes into trees and rocks. After all, what goes up must come down. Next, the kite maker sews a piece of leather called a fitting onto the plastic strap. It's made of leather to protect the kite's structural joints, such as the nose of the kite. It gets a leather patch as well. The kite maker uses a serrated saw to cut the 10 carbon rods to size. They're 6 millimeters in diameter and range in length from 18 to 81.5 centimeters. They form the kite's skeleton and, like bones, they're the most likely part of the kite to break in an accident. But if they do break, it's easy to replace them. A variety of molded plastic, rubber and aluminum fittings serve a dual purpose. They join the rods together and keep them from falling out of their sleeves. Now the kite maker attaches a nylon cord called a bridle to the fitting that joins the rods on the wing's leading edge. The bridle is the kite's rudder steering the kite to the left or right. The bridle comes off easily if you need to replace the rods. The kite maker now attaches tension lines to two plastic components called arrows. They're located at the kite's wingtips. She ties elastic bungee cords through the arrows to hold the tension lines in place. This makes all the fabric parts taut enough to fly. Next, she attaches the bridle to the center rod, the spine of the kite. She inserts the rod into its protective leather pouch at the nose. She inserts other rods into both sides of the wing. These give the wing its curved aerodynamic shape and help the kite stay aloft. Finally, additional rods under the wing provide more structure and support. These rods spread the kite and help keep it open. In the mood for a sky-high experience? For $250, you can buy a handmade model like this one and go fly a kite.